Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Derek Taylor, Terrell and I'm the Director of Member Engagement with Coalition for College. Uh, we're using the Zoom webinar uh, feature today um, and we have the Q&A in enabled, so feel free to ask any questions that you have through there. Um, I will also go ahead and enable the um, closed captions as well so that those are there and you will be able to see those below. Um, but feel free to ask any questions that you have throughout the presentation. Just use that, that Q&A feature there, and then we'll try to address them uh, at the end during the question and answer portion. So I'm going to share a little bit of information with you about the Coalition for College and the work that we do. Uh, so the coalition is made up of more than 150 colleges and universities that have a proven commitment to access, affordability, and student success. Um, so when you think of coalition colleges, uh, we really think of them as smart college choices because of that commitment that they all share because uh, they're dedicated to graduating students on time with low or no debt, um, and that includes those who have been historically excluded and underrepresented in higher education. So members of the coalition provide a variety of those smart college choices for students to explore and apply to with a wide range of student body sizes as well as levels of selectivity. Um, and still collectively, if you look at all the coalition schools and put them together and, and made one huge university, um, coalition schools actually outperform the national average by about 17% when it comes to retention and graduation rates, uh, which is something that's really important to consider as you think about um, uh, the money that you're going to spend for your, your education and, and the time that you'll be spending there as well. Um, if you haven't heard yet, actually, um, in, as of August 1st, uh, we actually launched a new application process with our partners over at SCORE. Um, so rather than creating a My Coalition account, you as a student will actually create your account on SCORE, and that's going to power your college search as well as the application process. Um, on SCORE, you'll be able to search and discover schools, collaborate with your supporters, and apply, and then also keep track of your application status and access portals where you've applied all from within your SCORE account. So it's one simple place to go to learn about college, apply to college, and then keep track of your admissions offers. So uh, we'll, we'll still provide our easy to use application fee waivers as well as um, all of those things there. Um, and you will be able to learn a little bit more about that later as well. Um, so the coalition and its members work to help students learn about, prepare for, and, and apply to college, as I mentioned. Um, so you, you should definitely follow us on Instagram to bring some of that insight and inspiration related to all things college right to your feed. And if you have any questions or anything following this webinar, uh, you can reach out to us via email at info at coalitionforcollege.org. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the introduction started off. So we have some wonderful colleges uh, joining us today uh, who are all coalition member schools. We have Arizona State, Bates, Rutgers, New Brunswick, Smith, and York College of Pennsylvania. Um, so before we get into the Q&A portion, um, I'm just going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and then share a little bit about their institutions. And we'll go ahead and kick it off with Chris over at Arizona State. Hi, good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you are. Chris Johnson over here at Arizona State, the largest public university in the U.S. and the number one institution for innovation, where we pride ourselves on who we include, not by who we exclude. Looking forward to your questions and hearing from the wonderful panelists tonight. Welcome everyone. My name is Scott Alexander. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Admission at Bates College. I've worked in admissions for over two decades now and as part of my job, I've traveled to about 80 countries. So um, don't rule out being a college admissions officer. It's not a bad career, that's for sure. Um, Bates is a small liberal arts college in Lewiston, Maine. We have about 2,000 students, 10% of our students are non-US citizens, and about another 10% are what we call students with an international background, representing about 80 countries. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Blackburn. I am our Associate Director of International Admissions at Rutgers, New Brunswick. We are located in the great state of New Jersey, about a 45-minute train ride from New York City. If you are bored that close to Manhattan, there is not much I can do to help you. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. I'm Bethany. I am an Assistant Director of Admission at Smith College. Uh, we're a smaller, medium-sized liberal arts school located in the Northeast region of the U.S. We are a gender-inclusive women's college. Um, we have about 14% international students. Um, and, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. We always want to try and get that number up. Um, and another 
sort of interesting factoid about Smith is um, our open curriculum. Um, the requirements for graduation are um, a lot more flexible and allow you to really tailor your academic experience to what it is that you're interested in learning. Hello, my name is Christian De Gregorio, Director of International Recruitment for York College of Pennsylvania. Uh, York is located on the East Coast. We were founded in 1787. We're a small liberal arts university. It offers bachelor, master, and doctoral degrees, and we focus on STEM. So think engineering, computer science, chemistry, pre-med, those types of majors. Awesome, thank you so much, Christian. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and get into the Q&A portion. Um, so when some of you all registered, you submitted questions. So we'll we'll start with those. But as I mentioned earlier, the Q&A function is enabled. So any questions that you all have, drop them in there. And I see that there are a couple that have already been submitted. So the first question that I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to direct to Scott over at Bates. Oh, yep, to Scott over at Bates. Um, so who qualifies as an international student? Uh, would a US citizen studying in an overseas high school be considered as an international student or not? That's a great question, Derek, and we actually get it very often. Now, before I answer, I want to give the caveat that we are five very different institutions here. We are part of 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. That's the beauty of the American system is that we have a lot of choice for you. The difficult thing is that um, we have a decentralized education system in the United States. So we each set our own policies. So my answer may not apply to every U.S. college. But in general, from my experience, um, applications are read by where you attend school, in general, in most admissions offices. So if you are a non-U.S. citizen studying in the United States, you're going to be read by the domestic recruiter for that region. Similarly, if you're an American citizen who is overseas, right, you're going to be read by the person reading that region of the world. So where you attend school really does define where your application is reviewed. However, your citizenship often influences um, your financial aid eligibility, right? So US citizen, um, US permanent resident, dual citizen, um, or non-US citizen within non-US, are you in the US in status or are you out of the US? Um, so all of that comes into play when it comes to financial aid. So think about where you attend school, as where your application will be reviewed and then think about your citizenship for financial aid purposes. Awesome, thanks so much, Scott. And then at any time, if any of you all wanna hop in, feel, feel free to uh, add as well. Um, the next question that I'm going to ask is actually going to go over to Chris over at ASU. Um, so is it required for all international students to take an English proficiency test? Yeah, thank you. That is a great question and one we get a lot. And as my colleague just mentioned, it's going to depend on your institution. I think most of us on this call tonight do require them, but there are going to be some institutions that do not require them, either because they include ESL or English language training as part of the curriculum, like at a community college, or because there are other kinds of things going on. So yes, as a general rule, However, it's also going to depend on uh, your country of citizenship, depending on the nature of your educational system, whether it was taught fully in English for 12 years, partially in English, um, whether you did a couple of years of high school in English and a couple of years in, in another language, um, we are constantly making those case-by-case -case, uh, determinations. The key thing to keep in mind, though, is that in many cases, we need proof of English proficiency as part of the immigration process, a paperwork issuance process that we're going to talk about later in the session. So it depends, but most of the time, yes, when in doubt, talk to your friendly admissions rep or read the information on the admissions website. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, the next question I'm going to ask Sarah. Um, so are there specific factors you look for when looking at an international student's application? Um, and then also, I think this actually goes uh, really well with a, a question that's submitted in the Q&A. Um, what about international transfer students? Complicated question. 
Um, and as with so many that have been asked this evening, this morning, um, it depends. I think if the school is looking for English proficiency, that's likely the only difference or one of very few differences that we would be looking for from an international student as opposed to any applicant. We're looking at your grades, we're looking at test scores if you've submitted them, English proficiency if it's required for you, essay, extracurriculars, all of those things that we've asked you to compile as part of the application. We are not asking international students to do anything differently. That said, if you're looking at a specific major or program, there may be specific requirements. For example, if you'd like to study engineering, I think it's very unlikely that you would be in strong consideration if you've never taken physics or if you don't have math as part of your curriculum. Um, so be looking at those websites, be mindful of what an institution may be looking for, for admission, for general admission to the university, as well as a specific major or program. Uh, same, same, but different for transfer students. There may be some requirements in order to apply, well, regardless of what passport you hold for a specific major. If you're looking to transfer to a business school, likely that they want you to have taken calculus or some foundational courses. Same thing for engineering. Um, but just be mindful of what those requirements may be generally and know that likely the only difference for you as an international student is that you may be asked to submit those English language proficiency scores or some other form of documentation indicating that you're proficient in English. Thanks so much, Sarah. I actually wanted to go, go back. Um, so one of the things that was asked in the question was, how do you stand out? And I feel like that's a question that gets asked a lot of the times by students. Can can one of you all just kind of touch on 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 that, like students' desire to stand out and 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 how they should kind of approach that? Um, I will just start by saying, absolutely, you want to try to catch our eye in the application, but I also think it's really important to be genuine. Um, I think students look at these essays or things that we're asking, supplements that we're asking for, and expect that we want you to be a creative writer or that we're expecting you to have the saddest story ever or the most inspirational story ever. And none of that is true. You are going to stand out just by being yourself. Um, you are you are special in that way on your own. One thing okay. I mean, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, I, I was giving a presentation this morning and it, it was exactly what, what Sarah said. And my advice to people was don't write what you think the committee wants to hear. Write from your heart, write what's important to you, write what a, why you want to attend the school that you're applying to, and why you're passionate about the field. If you could cover those four things, you're, you're on the right track. I was going to add, if you're using the coalition application, right, you're going to choose one of the topics to talk about yourself. And we realize that talking about yourself in certain cultures is very inappropriate. And you just have to remember that you're applying to the US for college. And one trait that is pretty consistent among Americans is that we can talk about ourselves. So we, when you choose your topic, make sure that you are writing a personal statement, that this is about you, that you're highlighting your voice, your experiences, um, maybe your goals, your, your potential, right, in your essay, um, that will make you stand out. Thank you all. Um, I know that there's another question that, that, that came up, even though Chris, you, you sort of touched on it, but I wanted to ask, um, I guess each school, if you could just, do, do a show of, of hands. Um, if a student is a US citizen attending a high school outside of the US and the language of instruction is English, do you require them to submit an English proficiency test? Okay, so Bates does yeah. not, does not, Rutgers does not, your college does not. And then Chris? It depends. It's gonna depend on how many years of, of, of uh, post-secondary education they had in English. Okay, awesome. So just wanted to make sure that everyone know, knows that. So four out of the five schools, you would not have to. Um, and at Arizona State, it's an it depends. So when you're looking at applying to other schools outside of these five wonderful schools, uh, you may want to ask them what their policy is for that. Awesome. Thank you so much, y'all. Um, the next question that I have is going to go over to Christian. Um, so what are important subjects for international students to focus on? Um, I, I, initial reactions, all of them. But I, I think this question in context what comes more from students who might be 
studying different curriculums such as A levels or taking an IB curriculum, something like that. Um, and, and then that's the case where you have a little bit more choices to which subjects to take. That's when the academic program of choice becomes, uh, becomes really important. So if you were, and I think Sarah, you might talk about this a little bit. So if, if you are you know, pursuing engineering, um, you might want to make sure you're, you, you brush up on your calculus, Calc 2 or Triggs, you know, computer science, same thing, or have a background with physics, depending on the type of engineering that you're going towards. If you're going towards accounting, business, economics, it's a different type of math. If you're going to uh, biology, you know, or one of the other sciences, you know, do you have an opportunity to take some basic chemistry, some basic biology, some anatomy and physiology? Um, when it gets to IB, then maybe, you know, do I need to take SL or do I need to take the HL? Um, and again, that really focus on the, um, where you want to study in terms of the academic program and then pursue that. So if it's, if you can take an HL calc or HL math and you want to go towards engineering, that's probably the, the, the better way to go. Awesome. Thank you, Christian. Um, next question I have is around, um, I guess, grading system. So with Bethany, um, how do admissions officers look at grades from international schools? Um, will they know my curriculum and my grading system? Yes, this is a great question. Um, and, you know, if you were to talk to fellow international students from different countries other than your own, you would find out that their graduation requirements might be different, the grading scales might be different, um, the, the subjects that they're taking in school can vary school to school. Um, so what I would say just speaking generally about uh, admission departments in the US is that most admission departments have folks such as the, the ones you see on the screen here who are specialized in international admissions. We're trained to read all different curriculums. We're trained to recognize the grading scales, um, maybe even converting from your country's grading scale to an American style grading scale. Um, so I would encourage you to just, uh, you know, take that pressure off of yourself because that is on the college uh, to take care of and, and not on you as the student, as the applicant. Um, so feel some relief there. There will be experts reading your applications. Um, and if you do have any concerns, um, maybe you're unsure if you need to get things translated or not, just reach out to the admission departments um, via email and say, hey, am I required to get these transcripts translated before submitting them? And those departments will absolutely be able to get into the nitty gritty of, of what they need from you. Awesome, thank you, Bethany. Um, I'm gonna do a, a follow-up question because there's one in the, in the Q&A. Um, so a student is asking if they have courses that are of honors or AP level, for example, in math, physics, chemistry, but they're not mentioned on their transcripts explicitly, how would a student, I guess, be able to let you all know um, about those courses? So the school counselor is a really great opportunity. Now, that's assuming your school does have a school counselor. So we realize that the structure of schools differs outside the United States than inside the United States. So um, if you don't have a school counselor, maybe it's your head of school, maybe it's your homeroom teacher, maybe it's your class advisor, someone at your school that's in a more official capacity, they in their letter of recommendation can reference that you are maybe in a more accelerated track than what is indicated on your transcript. So um, let your school either your counselor or maybe even your teachers articulate that for us. And um, we do read those letters of recommendation. So we'll place that in the context. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question that I have is going to go to Chris um, at ASU. So how can uh, I, as an international student, send my transcripts and what should I do if they are not in English? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, for the most part, most institutions, are going to require that those transcripts be translated. Some are, are stricter than others in terms of whether it has to be an official translation service 
or and whether it has to be notarized. Um, so again, talk to your friendly neighborhood admissions rep, read the website very carefully um, to find out what those requirements are. Um, secondly, in terms of how we get the record, so a lot of things have changed in the last two and a half years. Uh, we never used to accept electronic transcripts outside of some trusted vendors. Today, um, Arizona State and I think many other schools have a lot of different channels, whether that's uploading to sh uh, uh, shared secure folders between the school and the university, uh, whether that's an email attachment directly from the school to the university. Um, we still get lots of paper transcripts and sealed envelopes with the student's name and ID number written on them. So lots of ways that we can get those records, but I think in all cases, we need those official records um, and proof that you've completed your studies. Um, and if they're not in English, then, then translated uh, by a qualified translator. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Um, the next couple of questions are very loaded. Um, they're very <laughs> long and intricate. Um, so thank you in advance to Sarah for answering the first one. Um, and it looks like there are a couple of questions in the Q&A around um, SAT scores and standardized tests. So um, the question reads as follows. Are international students applying at a disadvantage if they don't have AP or SAT scores? Particularly, how will the decision not to send SAT scores affect my application and getting financial aid if I didn't have AP classes and there were no centers that provided the SAT? Whew. Um, I'll invite my colleagues to chime in on this one for sure. Uh, just, just um, yeah, phone a friend. Anyway, um, as far as being disadvantaged by not submitting SAT scores, let's start there. Um, if a school is test optional, there's a reason for that. It means that they want you to have the choice of whether or not you think that's a good representation of who you are as a student. So if the school is test optional, no, you're not at a disadvantage at all by not submitting your SAT scores, unless it happens to be required for something else, whether that's a special program, whether that's a scholarship opportunity. So be sure to read the fine print on when they are test optional and when they are not. Um, as far as SA, or AP scores are concerned, we are again reviewing you based on your school in context with what was available to you. We absolutely do not expect that you will have taken an AP course or an AP exam if that was not offered at your high school. One of the things that drives me so, so, so crazy is when I see a student who is doing a full IB diploma who has also decided to sit for an AP exam. Why? Don't torture yourself like that. You got four years of college to torture yourself like that. Um, so no, we're not expecting you to have APs, IBs, or any other form of credit before you come to the university, unless that was an option at your high school. And if it is, please take advantage of it for sure. Um, but no, not having those things, both SAT or APs, it's not going to be a disadvantage to you at all. I mean, I thought that was a great answer. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stick around the, the topic of, of scores, because as I said, there were a couple in the Q&A. Um, so the first question um, that I'm going to throw out to all of you all um, is, do you have a recommendation if a student has a choice between taking an AP course or a local college course? And to follow up, if they do take the AP course or the local college course, do you recommend that they also take the AP exam? Thank you. It's up for grabs for anyone. Okay, so I'll start us off. So um, I think it depends on what you des your desired outcome is, right? So if you're trying to show us rigor in your curriculum, both would be viewed as adding more rigor to your curriculum. So I don't think there would be too much of a distinction there. Now, if you're looking for advanced credit, there might be a distinction here. So some schools may have certain policies about what they would award for AP credit. So you might have to get a certain score on the AP exam in order to get credit. And a lot of us have different policies. Sometimes you get double credit. Sometimes you just place out of the intro course. So really dig into our AP credit policies if that's kind of your desired outcome of what, why you're doing the AP. 
Now, a class at a local college, sometimes we also have a lot of policies about what classes could transfer to us from other institutions. So um, often there's a multi-pronged test about it has to be a comparable class we might offer. You have to get a certain grade in that class. Um, it has to be majority college students in that class and not high school students taking that class. So there's often a lot of requirements around that too. So for me, it's really the intent, like what is the intent of you adding this? Um, and just know that if you want credit, really dig into what the policies might be versus AP versus um, the college transfer credit. Awesome, thanks so much, Scott. Um, and then the last last uh, question kind of around that, um, I know um, that Sarah, you had said, if you think the SAT score is a good representation, even at, if, if it's a test optional school, then, then to send it. Um, so the question was, how can you know what a good SAT score is for a test optional school? Most institutions are still publishing what their mid ranges are or averages for SAT scores. And so I think that's a really good guide. If your scores are falling within the range for the school program that you're interested in applying to, go ahead and send them. It's only going to help you. But if you find that your scores are falling at the lower end or below, then perhaps that's an, uh, an opportunity to keep that to yourself and let the other parts of your application shine. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and then and the last one I'm going to ask, just because it, it, it came in, but um, you all had, had said, if, if your school doesn't offer uh, AP classes and you take the, or you don't have to take the exams, right? So a student said, you know what, my school doesn't offer these courses in STEM, but they took the exams anyway, got a two and a three. Um, should they send in those, those scores? I don't think it hurts sending in the scores. Um, you know, for, for many of us, I know I could speak for York at some of the other universities that I've worked for, a three will get you credit. Um, you know, a two, you know, isn't going to, in in my eyes, the schools that I currently work for and have worked for in the past, a two is not going to get you a denial letter. Uh, but if you have a three, um, you know, that will, that will count for credit uh, when you attend that institution. I might add, um, know if that school looks at AP scores as part of its admission decision. So for instance, at Bates, we're test optional. We have been since 1984. That also includes AP scores. So we look at AP scores if you enroll at Bates for credit evaluation. We don't look at your AP scores as part of the admission decision. So understand those policies may differ as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay, the next question uh, that I have is going to be for Scott. Um, so what are financial aid opportunities for international students? And I'm actually going to tie that as well. Um, you know what, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> what, are, <laughs> what are financial aid opportunities for international students? Great. It's it's a question I can spend 15 minutes answering, um, but we'll do a very quick tutorial here. So there are, in my opinion, there are three types of financial aid. So you have need-based financial aid, which is based on your family's assets and income. You have merit-based financial aid, which is awarded to you based on some type of achievement. That could be your transcript, your grades, your standardized testing. Um, and then the third type of financial aid is talent-based financial aid. So maybe you're really good at a sport. Maybe you're really good at an art. Um, so you might get financial aid based on some type of talent. Now, it's important to know that every year at our institutions, you often have to reapply for financial aid annually. So a really great question to ask an admissions officer is what are the conditions to maintain my financial aid in future years? So if you are get need-based financial aid, often that's going to be consistent from year to year as long as your family financial circumstances don't change. Merit, maybe you have to maintain a certain grade point average, a GPA, in order to maintain that financial aid. Talent, maybe you just got to continue with your sport or your instrument or your art. So just make sure you understand what the conditions are, because clearly if you get financial aid your first year, you want it to continue throughout your entire four-year studies in the United States. Now, 
A second part of this is what are the sources of financial aid? So um, you might hear grant or scholarship. Essentially, that's gift aid. So that means it's, it's an award from some entity. Often it could be a government, it could be the institution itself. You don't have to repay that. So that's actually what you want to see the most of in your financial aid award. Some institutions may give you a loan as well. Now, if you're a non-US citizen, getting a loan in the US usually requires a US co-signer. So that does add a, a barrier potentially to some students. So um, know if you are given a loan about the conditions of that loan, um, because if you want to return home, clearly US dollars doing really well right now, it can be really hard to pay that back depending on where in the world you'd go back to. And then the last type of financial aid is either work study or campus employment. Now work study would be for US citizens, permanent residents, and then non-US citizens would have campus employment. Essentially they're the same, it's just who's paying your paycheck. So US citizens it might be, or permanent residents might be the US government, where non-US citizens are most likely gonna be paid from the institution. So um, know that there are three, generally, once again, every institution's different, but in general broad strokes, um, there are three sources of financial aid and three types of financial aid. Thank you, Scott. That leads really well into the next uh, question, actually, that I am going to ask Bethany. Um, so does financial aid cover everything, including travel expenses? Okay, well, this is great that Scott provided that really nice foundation for the different types of aid. Um, and I will also start by saying that uh, covering everything is is pretty broad. Um, and so I'll try and think of like a few areas where you might find yourself needing uh, more money in addition to the financial aid that Scott was talking about in, in those three different pots, we'll say. So um, travel expenses you mentioned. Um, you might find at some institutions that transportation to and from the campus is accounted for um, as part of the financial aid package that you receive. Um, not every institution. So I'm, I'm just going to say these are the possibilities that are out there. Um, another type of aid might be uh, discretionary funding, which is basically little pots of money that institutions have that you might apply for. Let's say uh, you all of a sudden have an unexpected medical need that you need to fulfill. You might be able to apply for that uh, pot of money to pay for your medical expense. Um, you might want funding to help get you to a study abroad program. So again, that airfare there. Um, it's good to look when you're thinking about study abroad and considering if that's something you want to do, if you're able to do, it's good to look at the colleges and universities and see, does your financial aid carry over during study abroad terms? Very important if you wanna make sure that, that you have the opportunity to study abroad there. Um, you might also um, find money, some colleges have, uh, pots of money devoted for low income students to get them started when they first arrive on the campus to pay for things like a laptop, um, bedding, toiletries, the, the types of things that you would need once you arrive in the front door. So that's a, another type of aid that you might find. Um, and a lot of times that aid might be tied uh, to what Scott was saying with financial aid. Um, Smith is one of the schools that does provide um, a grant to students who are contributing under a threshold. Um, so, so look for that in terms of your financial aid award. Um, and then another thing kind of more broadly, more institutions are, are starting to get on board. Uh, Smith is one of them with a no loan policy. Um, Scott talked about how loans can be a little bit more uh, complex for non-US citizens here. So um, Smith is an institution where 
the money that you receive from the college and your financial aid award, um, all of that is that grant money or that gift money that you don't need to pay back. So I think that's like another sort of different area, but just something to think about um, how it's going, how your financial circumstances are going to look after graduation. What are those um, grant versus loan sort of ratio going to be once you graduate? Um, and I know earlier, uh, Derek was saying that the coalition is comprised of colleges and universities that are really trying to make sure that um, we're balancing the burden of loans on students once they graduate. So take a look at some of the uh, financial aid policies of the coalition schools. See if you can find schools that are fitting all of the different boxes that Scott and I um, mentioned that you might be needing when you come to college. It's a very complex thing. So I know it's a, it's a lot of information. Um, honestly, I would recommend making an Excel sheet, a spreadsheet and ticking off like, you know, I'm gonna need money for, um, you know, buying a laptop. I'm going to need money that carries over for study abroad and then make rows for all of the different schools and put an X on all of the schools that are meeting your needs there. And then look for the call, the, the rows with the most amount of Xs. Um, financial aid can be really tricky and we definitely empathize with you trying to navigate not just a complex admission process, but also a complex financial aid process. And I would also add, um, don't hesitate to reach out to the student financial services offices. Usually a college will have like an admission office and a financial aid office. Sometimes they're one in the same. Um, but that is also another office in addition to us admission folks who can really help connect to you with the information and the resources that you need. Um, so you have help with all of this very dense uh, sort of uh, things to wrap your mind around. Thank you so much for that, Bethany. Um, that actually go, ties into the next question, which is around financial aid as, as well. Um, so do international students have to fill out any forms to receive financial aid, specifically uh, the FAFSA or the CSS profile? And I'll ask that to Christian. Yeah, so uh, real quick, what the FAFSA stands for is the federal, it's a federal application for, sorry, financial aid application for federal student aid. It is intended for domestic students and not international students. Um, however, there are some, some exceptions. Uh, if you are a refugee, if you're granted asylum, those people are eligible to file the FAFSA. Uh, but if you're just going for a, a generic F1 student visa or, or J visa, you are not eligible, sadly, uh, for the FAFSA and to get financial aid from there. You do need to check with the school in terms of what they require for a proof of, of finances. So some schools will require a CSS profile, some, some will not. Um, I'm sure there's some of us here on the call that do and some of us, some of us do not. Um, for York, we do not. However, you will be asked upon application what your um, financial plan is for your studies. You have to remember that um, a visa officer will not approve your travel to the United States if you do not have the funding in place. In order to get that visa appointment, if you do not have the funding in place, it, it, won't, it just won't happen. Um, so it really depends on the institution. Um, you know, I can't speak for everyone on the call or every institution here in the United States, there's 4,000 plus, um, but everything is different. You should have some sort of financial plan that will cover your tuition fees, uh, room and board, which is meals, books and supplies, personal expenses, um, you know, all these things you should have a, a budget for and really have an, an honest conversation with your, your parents, whoever your sponsor is, your family, whoever it might be as to what, what is within my budget. Remember, it's not how much money I have, it's what what is your budget realistically for your studies and there's plenty of schools uh, that are members of the coalition and have all, all different budget types uh, and all different costs and, and affordabilities for you 
Awesome, thank you. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm going to ask um, Scott a question because I, I know that Christian mentioned if you uh, were a refugee, um, that some of the, those forms would be, would be different. Um, but one question that had come in beforehand was about um, how uh, you look at undocumented students or students with DACA. Um, would they be considered domestic or international? Um, and the question was both around the application and admissions process, but also around financial aid. A great question. And I will start off by saying I use undocumented as an umbrella term where DACA is kind of embedded under undocumented. So just as a framing reference. Now, you've heard a little bit tonight or this morning, this afternoon, depending on where in the world you are, that it depends. And of any area in admissions, I feel like there's more variety here. And the reason why is each institution has a different mission. Each institution has different funding sources. Some are public, some are private. Um, and so you're gonna, some have state laws that dictate how admission works for undocumented students. So you're gonna have the most variety here. And my advice is that often an institution's policies, maybe how transparent they are with their policies, can be a window into the larger institution and how your experience may play out at that institution. So I find that if a school is much more transparent on their website, in their publications, about their undocumented admission and financial aid policies, it probably means that there's someone or a set of folks there that are going to be an advocate for you at the institution. So in terms of application, right, you're going to be some places may review you as an international student because of your citizenship type, you're a non-US citizen. Um, schools that are maybe more in tune um, are going to consider you as a domestic student. So because we read you um, at where you're located, where you go to school, so we're gonna read you as a domestic student. Um, and for financial aid, like uh, Christian just mentioned, you're not gonna be filling out the FAFSA, right? You're gonna be filling out um, maybe the CSS profile or maybe an institutional form for undocumented students. So that's gonna vary a lot. But once you are admitted and you are awarded financial aid, know that going back to the financial aid talk, your financial aid sources are likely to be um, grant aid or gift aid from the institution. And then if you're a DACA and you have work authorization, you may be getting an on-campus employment. But if you are undocumented, you are likely just to get gift aid completely from the institution. Another piece of advice is that you want to look for schools that meet 100% of demonstrated financial need if you're an undocumented student. That's really important. Um, and coalition schools are great places to look at um, because we are committed to access. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, the next question kind of goes around the immigrations process, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask Chris. Um, so how is the immigration process, or what is the immigration process like uh, to move from another country to the U.S.? Um, and will the university do the paperwork on a student's behalf? Great. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, immigration, migrating to the U.S., um, these are topics that require great patience. Um, and the reason that they require great patience is that there's an enormous amount of complexity, depending on your country, depending on your study level, your study program, your funding sources. In general, the way it works is first you apply, you get admitted to the university, and then at that point, the university says, okay, great, now we need to figure out the finances with you. Um, either through your own funds or through institutional dollars, as my colleagues have talked about. However that money comes together, we call it the package. However the package comes together, we have to demonstrate to the U.S. government that you have enough funding to meet the cost for your first year of study. Now, of course, you actually need to be able to manage four years of study or, or however long your program is going to be, but we're only required to show um, that first year. Once we have that, we issue a form called the I-20. Many of you have already heard of this form. Some of you will be hearing about it for the first time, but this is the form that lets you apply for a visa in your home country at the nearest U.S. Embassy or consulate. A consulate is a branch of the U.S. Embassy network within that country. All right. 
On the website of the embassy or consulate, there will be information about where to apply, when to apply, how to apply, the fees to apply. Um, in all of your countries, uh, locations, territories, there's a wonderful network called Education USA, which also exists to help students and they're located in your area. Um, and our website, our students, um, or I mean, our, our staff are there to help you as well, to guide you with that. The one thing I will close with, and this is so important, if you remember nothing else that I say tonight, I know you'll remember everything my colleagues say, but if you remember nothing else that I say, please plan ahead. I know many of you are strong students and are planners by nature. Visa avail appointment availability remains a difficult subject in many parts of the world, even two plus years into uh, the pandemic. Um, and if you wait to the last minute, I'm afraid you, you may miss out. Um, but in general, that's the sequence with a lot of possible twists and turns along the way. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so I know we have just about 15 minutes left. And I want to address some of the questions that are coming in into the Q&A. Um, it's, it's come up a couple of times, but there's this idea of a disadvantage if you're an international student. Um, and I mean, it, it, it's been expressed in a couple of different ways. So there's one where a student is a US citizen but lives internationally and they're asking, will I be at a disadvantage because I'm at an international or I'm, I'm living abroad? Another question was an international student or a non-US resident who goes to a US high school and worrying that they'll be at a disadvantage because they will be applying as a non-US uh, citizen and as an international student. So I'm just gonna kind of throw, throw it out there and let you all um, answer and, and, and pick what, what you think might be suitable for this, this audience. But it seems like a lot of the students on the call are worried about being at, at some sort of disadvantage in the admissions process. So we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. And don't everyone unmute at, at once, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna un unmute and, and dive on that one. Um, so yeah, you're right, everyone. Uh, there's a lot of people who think they're, they're at a disadvantage because um, maybe they're studying outside of the U.S. where they're not going to do the SAT or they are going to do the SAT. Um, and it could be really confusing. And, and, and with 4,000 institutions, um, and we all do it a little, a little bit differently. Um, so it can be tough. If you study hard, if you get good grades day in and day out, this is what, at least what I'm concerned about, and I think my colleagues are most concerned about. Are you studying hard? Do you do well day in and day out? I'll take that over what somebody's doing on a test for three hours and 45 minutes on some Saturday, any day. You know, that's what I'm mostly, mostly after. Are you at a disadvantage if you're a US citizen studying abroad? From, from the research of our applicants, um, people who study outside of the United States tend to have the higher GPAs and the higher SAT scores. That's that's what we find in, in our students. Um, and then people who are, you know, from the other parts of the world studying in the United States, you know, they do well day in and day out. If you're doing your homework, you're completing your assignments, that's that's what it's all about. So so don't worry about controlling what you can't control. You can control your grades, you can control what you when you turn in your homework. You can control those things. Control what you can control. Will your your ship, you know, steer it? That's how I'll answer that. Awesome. Does anyone else want to chime in or, or, or add anything? Okay. Um, so there is another question about financial aid. Um, oh, and also thank you, Christian. I think that was very well 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 put. So thank you. Um, the another question about financial aid. So basically, um, if a student were to um, receive a scholarship from another source, uh, they're wondering, is it true that their scholarship or grant would be reduced from the institution? Um, and I, I, I think that might be an it depends question, but I'll let you all uh, answer that. Uh, at nods. <laughs> yeah, so it depends. Um, so 
each institution has varying policies. I've worked at three different schools in my admissions career, and they all had different policies on how to treat outside scholarships. So um, some institutions um, may reduce their grant portion, their gift aid, um, which, to be honest, um, helps other students, right, get, get um, financial aid. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some schools will say, hey, you worked really hard to get this outside scholarship. So we're going to reduce your loans or your self-help portion. Other schools will say, great, keep it, use it for your, in your indirect expenses, like, like Bethany mentioned, like your, your travel or your computer. So it will vary. So it's really important to have that Excel sheet and know every institution's policies and, and mark them off. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Um, another question that, that's coming in um, is about, will coalition colleges be coming to my country um, for any sort of expo or, or to visit? So rather than, than, than that, just I'll, I'll ask, um, do your institutions travel internationally? Okay, so everyone has nodded yes. So every institution on here has admissions officers who travel um, internationally. That does not mean that they'll be at every Ex, uh, every expo in, in every country, um, but I'm sure if you look at their admissions websites um, and get on some of their mailing lists that you will be notified if they are coming to your area. Um, so the next question that I, I have, and this is a really good one that I'm going to throw out. Um, so a student asked um, about there not being very many volunteering or work opportunities in their, uh, in their country or their, their area. Um, and they feel like there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of emphasis placed on extracurricular activities um, in US universities. So um, even if their level of, of activity is not as much as let's say a student who were uh, residing and studying in the US, how would you all think about it? What do you think about virtual experiences? It's a very long question, but I hope somebody will answer it. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can jump in here. So um, every institution will be different. That is the theme of the night. Um, but what I would say is that many institutions will consider things outside of, you know, a traditional club or a volunteer opportunity. Um, many institutions count a paid job that you have. Um, I know at Smith, like taking care of a sick family member, that absolutely counts as part of your extracurricular life outside of the classroom. Um, as Derek mentioned, there are a plethora of virtual uh, experiences that you can have. And so institutions will come at those things with um, varying weights, we'll say. Um, but what I would say is universally, we are looking at you not just in the classroom, but who you are to your community. Um, who you are to your family, what impact are they having on you, how are you giving back to them, because when you come to our institutions, you're not just going to be a brain in a jar, <laughs> you are going to be a person on our campuses, and so the extracurriculars are just kind of like a little window for admission to see what is this student going to be like on our campus? How are they going to be um, sharing space in the residence halls? Um, what are they going to be like as a friend or a teammate on a, on a sports team? So they're just like a little blip into who you are outside of the classroom experience. And there are so many different ways that you can show what you do outside of the classroom. Classroom. Um, as Derek noted, like there are, are very varied amounts of access that students have due to their family's financial situation, um, cultural norms, um, resources in the community. So we are very much aware of that and we will look at you in the context of your community, in your country, um, that sort of thing. We, we want to see the whole person. We really do try and take a, a holistic view in the U.S. Um, of the applicants that we get. So thank you so much. And then I'm going to go ahead and switch to a question. Thank you for whoever submitted this. They said, this is a more lighthearted question. Um, so do you all have any applicants or, or any international students uh, applications that just really stuck out to you? Um, and it doesn't have to be their essay, 
Um, but what was it that made them memorable to you? Just any nice little anecdote that you'd like to share. My story is not actually about an applicant, but it's about a student that I had the pleasure of working with at an essay workshop. Um, I think my colleagues may agree that it is common um, to read essays about sports. Um, we do read a lot of essays. It's a very common topic. For some reason, it like always happens to be raining at the championship game, et cetera, et cetera. So I sat down across the table from this student and she told me that she was writing her essay about her cross country running. Um, and I was like, okay, here we go. Let's get ready to have a chat about something that I read a lot about. And I was like, okay, all right, all right. So, you know, we read these a lot. What would make your essay perhaps a little bit different from others? And she was like, Ugh. and I was nervous you were gonna ask me this. Okay, so here's the thing. I have gross feet. Not like any sort of a medical condition. She just kind of had like knobby toes and her feet were kind of ugly looking as most feet are. Um, but she was like kind of self-conscious about this. And so that was something that she would get teased about in the locker room, friends and family. Like this is a girl who's going with closed toed shoes everywhere. But at the same time that this was a big insecurity for her, it was also one of her greatest strengths. It was something that might be taking her to national, international competitions. It was something that may have gotten her a scholarship at a university because she was such an exceptional runner. And so her whole essay was about that duality of being so kind of ashamed and embarrassed about something that was also something that made her the most proud. I'll never forget that student. I thought it was just so fascinating. What a wonderful twist on an essay that we read a lot. I love that. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and one, one, one last question that I'm, I'm going to ask, because I know this is very um, in, in important. So um, a student is uh, saying that they're, they're from a, an, an area where not a lot of people go to universities in the U.S. Um, and so a lot of your universities uh, require that, um, that students submit recommendations. Uh, what, what advice would you give a student who might um, need some help with, with the process. So say that their teacher or professor is having difficulty submitting them or just wherever they get snagged up, uh, snagged in the process, um, especially being uh, in, a, in an area where most people might not apply to U.S. universities. Any words of wisdom for them? Are you talking about what, what should be in the letter or just physically getting that communication to the university? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think if, if there's, you know, if, if the people around them don't know how to send something or, or where to send it, um, what, what kind of advice would you give the student? Um, yeah, I, I, I do run into this um, a little bit here and there where the, the letter writer may not speak English um, or, or the letter writer, um, you know, is not used to writing just letters of recommendation or they, they don't use email and, and how do they get that? Um, so if it's something where they don't speak English, uh, sometimes I'll ask for an official translation. Um, sometimes an Education USA Center will help out in terms of sending physically that, that letter of recommendation uh, to us, either by email or through the coalition app or some other platform. Um, so, so we have used that in the past. So there's always usually some kind of work around. Uh, that, that we can do either through email or regular you know, sending it through the post. Uh, you can do that too. Awesome. I would add, um, just going back to like Bethany's comment that we are seasoned admissions professionals, right? So we know to review letters of recommendation within cultural context. So for instance, American letters of recommendation are very effusive, right? In the US, everyone gets a trophy. So um, when we read letters of recommendation for maybe outside the US, they're often a little bit more like assessments than recommendations. So we always evaluate things in the context. Um, and so if you feel like your letter uh, might not be as glowing as some other from maybe around the world, don't worry, we, we always place that in the context. Thank you so much, that was great. Um, so we are actually at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let us wrap up with that. Thank you so much to our college uh, folks who were on, on here. 
Um, your words of wisdom are going to carry on forever. Uh, for those of you who are on the call, this is recorded uh, and will be uploaded to our, our website. So you'll be able to go back um, and reference anything that was said here. Also, thank you so much to all of the, the students who are on the call and for asking such amazing questions. Um, and we wish you the best of luck on your college admissions process. Um, and we will have many more events this, this fall. So um, feel free to check out. I believe it was just dropped in the chat, um, the events that we have for this fall, um, and we will see you then. But for now, have a good night, good morning, good day from wherever you are calling in from. Okay, see ya. Thanks.